Hello everybody, I'm Debbie Montgomery Johnson, founder of the nonprofit The Woman Behind the Smile, and your host of Stand Up and Speak Up, a show that is about each and every one of us. Many of us have something, something we're hiding, something we're ashamed of, something that through no fault of our own or through our own making we keep hidden, and that in turn keeps us hidden from each other and the world. Good people go through terrible situations. Wise people know when and how to let it go. Everything that happens to us helps, it grow, helps us grow, and while it may be hard to see it right away, the most important thing to do is to change your perception about your circumstances. Regardless of what your personal experiences or traumas have been, this showcase series is designed to ignite the light in you, as well as providing safe harbor, education, personal growth, and resources, so that no matter where you are on your journey, you'll have the courage to move on when you're ready. Stand Up and Speak Up features ordinary people who've been through extraordinary situations and struggles and found the courage to step out from behind their smiles and speak up about their experiences and the lessons gleaned from those experiences. Everybody heals at a different pace, and we recognize that. So come on in, have a listen, and enjoy the ride at your own speed. Hello, everybody from sunny South Florida. I'd like to welcome you to Stand Up and Speak Up. Today is a fun day. I have some energy in the house coming to us from cold Canada, uh, but just a hot, hot, hot woman and friend of mine, Miss Allison Harvey. Allison, are you there today? Yes, I am, and thank you, Debbie. I am so, so honored to be on your show. I can't believe we're finally doing this. Hello, everyone from Toronto. We are cold, but we don't have a lot of snow. Well, I've got to tell you, she is, Allison and I met a few years ago. We met on a cruise, and it was a cruise sponsored by a friend of mine. It was called Lead Her Ship, and it was Sharon Frame. Sharon connected us. We have these great women around the world that are networking and doing, uh, ours was on a cruise. The cruise was the kick in the pants for me to get my book written so that I could present it on the, in, this, in the conference. And... Allison was there. She was at the conference. I don't know how you met Sharon. Can you tell me how, how did you know Sharon? I actually met Sharon because I was doing Woman on Fire in Atlanta. Okay. So meeting Sharon in Atlanta, she invited me to come on this cruise. And I was like, what? Networking on a cruise ship? Right up my alley. As everyone knows me, the networking diva, I thought this would be an amazing opportunity to meet women from around the globe or whoever decided to be on that cruise with her. And bam, you know, you were one of the amazing women that I met on the cruise, Debbie. Well, it was fun because we were going to Jamaica and we had just a variety of women and so much fun. But for me, the most important part of that trip, besides coming out with my book that first time, is that I took my mom with me. And it was the first time I'd ever traveled just with my mother, not any of the rest of the family. And there were several other women that brought their moms. And we ended up calling them the wow women, which were wi uh, women of wisdom. Uh, but it was extraordinary. And I remember you sitting there when... Um, I, I remember this whole atmosphere, uh, you know, the whole conference room. There weren't a lot of us there, but we sort of sat back. And then we started chatting. And then it was just like ignition. And I loved your energy. You know, you just sort of perused the room and you were just assessing. I could tell. I could see your brain going. And then we just had a blast. And then it ignited the Caribbean in you. You're from Trinidad. <laughs> let me kind of, let me tell people who you are. It is Allison Harvey or as she's finally fondly called by her friends woman on fire is the founder of the international event woman on fire she's also the founder of the, the haitian initiative hope which is hope crossing borders and the annual magazine woman on fire entrepreneur magazine she's a speaker entrepreneur philanthropist travel designer a foodie <laughs> love that and she has mastered the art of networking she is definitely a woman on fire. She hails from the lovely island, twin islands of Trinidad, Tobago, known for its annual carnival, steel pan, yes. and limbo. Oh, that's, I think, where you were with my mom. <laughs> and she moved to Canada a long time ago, and I'm not quite sure she, why she would move from a lovely island to Canada, although nothing about Canada. I love my Canadian friends. She was work, uh, working a regular 9-to-5 corporate job in Canada, but that wasn't for her. She then ventured into entrepreneurship, and that's where we're going to go. Allison, what took you from the beautiful islands up to 
beautiful Canada. I would have to blame that on my father. So he lived in Canada for a while, and being in Trinidad, you know, a lot of us want to leave and come out, and if you have kids, you're going to bring them to these countries. So if you're in America, you bring them to America. If you're in Canada, you kind of bring them out here. And then I came out to Canada, and then he met somebody and moved to um, the States. So he's there. So my dad lives in the States, but I stayed here because I really, really loved the country, and I really liked the people and the friends that I was making. And um, entrepreneurship has been part of my life before leaving Trinidad. So it started on a small scale, and then I came out here, and of course you had to get the job and all that kind of good stuff, but I always had that entrepreneurial spirit about me, so it just blossomed in Canada where you have so much opportunities going from zero to whatever your heart's desire once you put the work in there. Okay, now I read somewhere that you got your first taste of business from your mom. Can you go back and remember what your mom made you do? Yes. My <laughs> mom was always a business person. She's an amazing chef, um, amazing cook, and, she, you know, we do all of this stuff in Trinidad. And um, I remember one specific occasion, I wanted to get um, a pair of roller skates. Roller skates. Back then it was roller skates, okay? Debbie, <laughs> I so remember. I'm dating myself here. You remember, remember those roller skates? Not roller blades. Not roller blades. And she said to me, if you can get the money for it, you can buy it. And that started my journey as an entrepreneur. Because she wasn't going to give it to you. No, no, no. So, we didn't so, have money for that. We, you know, we weren't rich. My mom wasn't rich and stuff like that. So up here, roller skates was like a luxury item. You so know what I mean? You, so when you tell you get your them? mom, okay, can I get roller skates? Mm, that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. But she was willing to say, you know what? If you can make the money, you can buy them. So how did you do that? And so I started going door to door selling items in a catalog. I never forgot that. I got this catalog and I went and knocked on people's doors and I was selling so much that I was able to buy my roller skates and also ended up with extra pocket money. Well, that is a very brave thing to do, to go knocking on doors. <laughs> Back then it wasn't. Back then people were, we should say, nicer. You can't go <laughs> knocking on doors these days, unfortunately. But back then it was okay. People were like, oh, yeah, come in. And you would go into their houses, Debbie, and you would sit and they would pick out stuff. But I was always close to home. Not yeah. that people don't disappear close to your homes these days, but I was always close to home and, I'll, and you know, people would be repeat customers and stuff like that. You know, they were buying Tupperware, they were buying all of this kind of stuff. And yeah, that's how I started making money and I liked it. That's cool. And I'm sure, you know, you were probably young and cute and, you know, everybody was just like, oh, let's help her out. Yeah, but, that's but interesting. I, I just, I like the interaction. That's what I love. I love the interaction. And to this day, I love interacting with people like that. Well, and you do it extraordinarily well. Have you ever felt I like do, a stranger I? in a room? Never. <laughs> I never feel like, because I'm always excited about meeting people. And this is one of the keys to networking. You should be excited to be there. You put yourself in that place to meet people. So you should really be going in your A game. You should be going 100%, the smile on, the attitude, you know, um, the, the interest, the interactiveness, the let me get to know you. Hi, my name is, oh, my God. You know, you should be part of that. If you're going to walk in a room and be networking, you need to put yourself out there. And, yes, there are people who are shy. There are people who, you know, are not as, you know, like myself, outgoing. But if you're going to put yourself in that room, you really have to practice these things. And simple, like a smile. Hi, how are you? A smile changes everything, and you know that. Well, I was just going to say, how, how, when you walk into a room, you don't blast in. I mean, a lot of people become the item of, oh, look, we just walked in the door. I don't think you do that. You go in and, no, and assess. I, you know what? When, you, when I walk into a room, it's not about blasting in, but it's about, for me, just walk in a room and just glancing around, taking note of what's going on in the room, the people and everything, and trying to get a feel for the room. Try to get a feel for the room. You know what I mean? You don't have to be massively outstanding or anything else. And you look, you look for something. You make a target of something or somebody that you can approach or go to, even if it's a code check person. You can meet people at the code check. 
You mm-hmm. can meet people at the registration table. I started from the time I get in the room connecting with people because, you know, people discount people just because, okay, you're not part of the event. The volunteers, everybody, I'm, everybody's part of my world when I walk into a room. I have a friend down here. She wrote a book called The One Philosophy, and it was about making other people the one for you, um, rather than you being the one for them and, and going in there saying, you know, I'm not looking for that one that's going to change my life. It says, how can I be that one for them? And I see a lot in, of that in you, where you'll go in and you'll, how do you pick the person that you're going to talk to, though? How, what, how, are you, how do you become the one for them? Um, you know what? You know, I, I know you're probably very aware of this, and there's some listeners on the line. It's all about vibrations, I think. People call to you. Mm-hmm. You know, we're vibrating at that frequency, and it might sound a little bit of woo-woo, but if you listen to your instincts, if you listen to how you feel, you will actually feel drawn to people. Now, some of it may work, some of it may not work, but I feel drawn to people. You know, you may see, okay, if I smile and that person smile, it's a welcome. Hey, I will talk to you. Mm-hmm. It's an open invitation. If the person doesn't look friendly, you look at them and they turn away, then you see there's no connection. But if that person smiles at you, if that person says, hey, hey, how are you? Oh, my gosh, my name is Allison. I'm from Toronto. Oh, wow. I, we start talking. So really is look for that invitation, but you yourself have to be open. You don't go in there with a frown on your face and people look at you and you're frowning. No, you want to go in there with a smile and open to receive just as you're open to give. So somebody looks at you, they may be serious, but if you smile at them, hear what? They may smile back at you, which is really always interesting. It is, and I think the most important part of that whole thing is, and you have it in here, it's it's listening. It's going in there and, you know, because you've got that lot of energy, and I... I can, but typically in a big situation, I'm not terribly comfortable walking into a big room like that. I will assess too, and then I'll find one person I can start talking to. And but if that person comes across overbearing, then I'm like, oops, mm-hmm. you know, I'm not sure this is going to happen. Or you know, it might give me some energy to to jump in. Um, but I I tend to look for more of the quieter people because I know that they've got a story <laughs> that they want to. <laughs> And, and they might not feel comfortable with having all that high energy until you get to know them. And right. then, and you're boom. 100% right. But even those people give you the invite. If you start paying attention, mm-hmm. even that person, the one standing on the wall, the one that makes saying, and you may gravitate towards that person, once you approach them, they're open. They're open because that's yeah. what they're there for. You know, and they just want somebody to approach them. Again, that opens the door with that smile. And you just give a little smile, hi, and they're open to you. And I see it all the time. So the invitation has to be there. The acceptance of the invitation has to be part of it as well. So I tell people all the time, when you go to an event, be open to receive and give. You know, don't just take but also give because you don't know what you're opening that door to. Absolutely, and when you're going to those events, I mean, sometimes networking can get, you know, you're just handing out cards. That's not what you want to do. Um, and I belong to the Women's Prosperity Network, and we're all about coopetition and just getting to know each other and, you know, on a, on a woman-to-woman basis, more like sisters. And, uh, and so you go in there. For me, it's I'm going to find one person in this event that I can connect with. You might find 50, but go in with at least one you know, or one thing you want to learn, um, because no, definitely. networking can be daunting. It can, you know, depending on the why you're there. Uh, how often do you go out networking like that? Uh, is this pre-COVID question? Well, yeah, I guess I guess it's, <laughs> it's changed. But how have you pivoted? How have you gone? Because you were doing a lot of a lot of events. How have you changed um, your your organization since this thing happened? Uh, well, a lot of it is online. Well, all of it, I should say, is online. And, and incredibly, I've met a lot of people, different people online, because now people can come in from wherever in the world. So when we go to an event, let's say I go to an event in Toronto, then um, I'll meet people, chances are, from Toronto. But with Zoom calls, you're open to meeting people from all over the world. I mean, I've gotten calls and there are people from France and Norway and, and, you know, Kenya and South Africa and Italy, and there are people from the Philippines online. Mm -hmm. So that's another amazing place. And if it was, you know, pre-COVID, 
I may never have, I would never have met those people. Absolutely. So you go in there with that same energy. It is different. Some people don't like to be on camera, and I always say people, one thing I would like to say to people going on Zoom, please put your camera on. It's really like turning your back when you're in a room, and you would never do that in a room. So if you're going to go in a Zoom, just take the time to make yourself look presentable and put the camera on. It's very... I think a little bit disrespectful to not put your camera on if you're going into a room because it's a room. It's a Zoom room. So let's pay that person the attention that they're looking for that they expect from their people because if everybody turned their camera off, what would happen? So really, really think about it as an entrepreneur and as a business person that if you're going on these Zooms and you're going there for business and so on, please put your camera on. It adds so much more to the Zoom than having this dark spot. And I can say I'm guilty of not putting my camera on sometimes, but no, I really pay attention and I put my camera on. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I do that too. Sometimes I'll be multitasking and just want to listen and uh, don't want yeah, them. Yeah, you know, it's I'm, not good because if you went to an event, you wouldn't do that. That's a true statement. It's a true statement. Interesting. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> and people okay. don't want to hear it, but, it, it, you know, let's give <laughs> each other that respect. That's true, and that's what it is. It, it is respect because that person has spent time putting together that, that Zoom call. Uh, there is a reason for it. And um, that, that, So you called me on that one. Thank you, dear. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Eh? I tend to call people when I give these talks, and they're like, oh, you know, Allison. I said, but think about it. You know, if we do that all the time, after a while, you know what, I have a Zoom, it's from 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock, everything is blocked, I'm not doing anything else, that's what I'm going to do. It's purposeful, that's why we're doing it. You're yeah. doing it on purpose, and again, there's yeah. something to learn from it. Yesterday I was on one, actually, it was a, a friend of mine who um, is living in the Netherlands, and there was a gal there from Germany, there was one from, well, no, one, another one from Florida, but again, from all over, different ages. And as we listened, we were talking about finances and why we do things based on our family, what our families taught us. I'm sitting there going, I wonder what the difference, you know, if you were to do, do, do research on this, generationally, those of us that are in our 60s were thinking one thing. Those that were in their 30s were thinking another. But we've all heard our mothers say certain things, like money doesn't grow on trees or don't talk about it or that kind of stuff. I mean, we're so much alike in so many ways if we would just sit and listen to each other. And that's what I love about you. You said something once that if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Go yep. with someone. Go in a group, yeah. Because go that in a way, group. You know, each, each one will hold the other one up. You know what I mean? We all share things. You know, when they say there's more than two minds in a room, it's now a mastermind. Because you, my ideas and your ideas are two different things. Perspective. You talk about perspective. I was listening to your intro, and you talk about putting yourself, you know, in that perspective, and you will see the difference. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm like, yes, you really have to. I remember I went on a, um, a hike in the summer with my friend, and there was a very steep hill. It was like a 40-feet drop, and um, she ran it down. And I was like, oh, my God, I can't run. I'm going to die. I'm not <laughs> doing this, right? And so she left. She said, okay, I'll wait. Um, I'll go, and I'll come back. I said, okay, I'll wait for you, right? And I stood there, and I'm like, okay, I want to go down. I want to go down, Okay. So what do I do? I start looking around, I start looking around, and then I found an easier path. And when I got to the bottom, I looked up, and I was like, wow, this is not as bad as it looked from above. Mm -hmm. And that really hit me. So a lot of things we do are really based on perspective. And in order to sometimes see it 360, we really have to change our perspective. I'm going to blast right into this one. Why did you start Woman on Fire? Explain to everybody what that is and why you started it. Um, I actually started Woman on Fire. The people who know me for years and years know this. I started Woman on Fire to raise funds for Haiti. After the earthquake in Haiti in 2010, I was so touched by everything that was going on. I was so moved by everything. I mean, the, the devastation, the people. And I had always had an interest in Haiti from 
before leaving Trinidad, I always heard about Haiti, you know, and but never got there. And then the earthquake happened, and I ended up in Haiti. You know, cutting short, I ended up in Haiti, and I fell in love. You know, it's like falling in love. I call it falling in love with a mechanic when he's all dirty, and then you know. <laughs> going forward after that and I fell in love with Haiti and it's been 11 years that I've been going to Haiti when I wanted to raise funds because you know I had never done anything like this and you have to raise funds and I said you know what I could hold a uh, luncheon I could invite women over and we could sit and talk and connect and meet new people and woman on fire happened and there were two names there were two names, and I sent it out to my group, and I said, okay, we need a name for this event. We could either call it uh, We Run Things, Things Now Run We, which is a Jamaican term, right? We Run Things, Things Now Run We, or we could call it Woman on Fire. What do you guys think? And they all came back with Woman on Fire, and I was like, oh, my God, okay, we'll do Woman on Fire, and that's how Woman on Fire started. The event was actually supposed to be three-hour luncheon. We had a drink called Woman on Fire. We had a dessert for Woman on Fire. Everybody came. We had such an amazing time. We went from three hours to six hours. We were, like, at this restaurant all day. Nobody wanted to leave. And some of the girls like, Allison, you've got to do this again. You've got to do it bigger. You've got to be whatever. Next year, you've got to do this again. And I'm like, what are you talking about? But... Debbie, let me tell you, all year people were talking about Woman on Fire and how it was so good and how they met this person. I'm like, we're a handful of women. We're like 20 women in a room. But it just kept growing and growing. And then I had Woman on Fire in the following year and was a packed room. It was a smaller room, a small room, but it was a packed room and way bigger than my 20 people. Right? So and that's how, and it just kind of grew from there. I got to Atlanta because somebody saw what I was doing in Toronto, mm-hmm. and that's how we got to Atlanta. So what do you think draws women together to something like that? Um, I think because I'm very much, um, I, as you can tell, I, I like to converse. <laughs> I mm-hmm. like to have conversation, and I'm a very hands-on person. I like to connect with people. For me, it's not just sending out the emails and whatever, but physically talking, physically touching people. Now we have a lot of stuff we didn't even have 10 years ago. We have WhatsApp. We have, um, we're online. We're on Zoom. We're on Facebook. We're on IG. We, we're on all these social media platforms, and we're no longer touching people. And I think that makes a huge difference. Pick up the phone. Instead of sending a text, pick up a phone and talk. It's the same phone. Mm-hmm. You know, one button. One button that you're pushing, right? I totally agree. Totally agree with pick that. Pick up the phone. Yep, because we have this connection. And it's like being on Zoom. You're kind of looking at this picture. And, you know, we've got to be careful about sometimes pictures because they're, you know, I work a lot with, with uh, women that have, been defrauded or you know scammed in, in online relationships mm-hmm. and we're looking at pictures well pictures can be fake um, but in person you know I, I go back to the event that you had up in Toronto that I went to and spoke at and thank you so much for having me that was such an extraordinary adventure to explain to the to the audience that is listening when we did the Canadian one you set aside an evening event for me to be the speaker and we had it in our PJs it was a pajama party for me it was the most extraordinary event and I wanted to come back to the States and do pajama parties after that because it was an opportunity for us to kind of put aside or you know we put on our jammies we brought our pillows some some people brought little stuffed animals or whatever they wanted to feel comfortable in but we put all of the the trappings of the world aside basically and we were there as it just t- t- took me back to when I was a young girl and would spend the night with my girlfriend. You know, we'd be giggling and laughing. And then when I was able to tell my story, it opened up the room for people to feel safe, to be able to talk about things that had happened to them. And I remember some folks came up and were in front of the whole room, holding my hand, you know, in our pajamas, telling about 
things that had happened, domestic abuse, violence, you know, things that happened when they were children. And it was extraordinary because it wasn't about me. It was about them and them feeling comfortable enough to share their story. And when people share their story, at least I found this, they, you learn so much about them. And then you realize you have so much in common. Uh, or you also feel that, well, gosh, my story's not so bad anymore. So you get out of that poor pity me part. Have you done yeah, that since? Yeah, we, we still do the pajama party. And again, it breaks down the barriers. And I know you felt that because I remember the angst you felt when I said, oh, we're in pajamas. And you went like, no. I'm like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and that was really crazy. But what it did, it made people feel comfortable mm -hmm. you know what I mean and because we're so out there putting on this face you know the smile you know it's what you do you, you the, the yep. woman behind the smile and taking that away we're able to show the people behind the smile at my events to, to steal a little bit from you yeah, right. we, we, we want that. We want, everybody wants to be seen and heard uh, and understood and, and accepted and the pajama party accepts people. The way I do things accept people. I always say my stage is not for me. It's for everybody. I want all my audience to know they have the ability to be on my stage, and that's why I share my stage all the time. If you look at any of my events, I don't think I'm ever standing on my stage by myself. I no, always you're, share because it's easy for people to sit in, a, in an audience and sit and say, wow, I don't know if I could ever do that. But once they get that opportunity, and I've seen women cry and say, I've never been on a stage before. Mm -hmm. Never. It, it was amazing. And I was listening to someone yesterday who was talking about how uh, the difference between men and women in this particular case, when women get together and start sharing things like that, it releases oxytocin. And that's very comforting. And, you know, we all pull together and it's like we're holding hands and talking about the things that have been devastating in our lives. And, and then we pull together and we rise. Whereas the guys, they're not going to really talk about their issues. It would separate them. And I love how yeah. at the pajama party, there's no men involved there. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the girls. <laughs> yeah, there, it's just the girls. I mean, I tried to pull the men together with the girls. Didn't work. I'll tell you for free. Didn't work. Yeah. It was just different. I mean, I think maybe putting guys by themselves and women by themselves. But I found with women um, coming into that scenario, we have so much. We, we are always asked to present. We're always asked to be on show. We're always, you know, looked at and judged. Um, yeah. Even if you feel, oh, I'm great, I'm whatever invariably you are judged. You're judged by the way you look, you're like the way you sound. You're, we're judged. Even if people don't come out and say it, they're looking at you. And so we want to be the best that we can be at every single situation. We want to look the best, act the best, talk the best. And so people don't really get to see the real us. And that's they a shame. The real you, and that's a shame. And that's and that, a shame. That's that's a shame because that's the whole premise of the woman behind the smile. We all put on that smile at some point in our lives. And we're just yeah. fooling ourselves. It, it, there's yeah. nothing wrong with having a crack, having a flaw. That's what makes us so unique and so individual and so welcoming. And your yeah. crack might be the same as mine, but might have a little twist to it. But I'm feeling alone because of mine until I hear about yours. Yeah. And that's a great thing, and, and I love that. I love that, that you know that we connected. Um, and as I was saying on the cruise, the thing that you asked me this once in an interview, what was the most, what was the, the one of the defining moments for you when you brought out your story? For me, it was doing it in front of my mom, because it yeah. was the first time my mother had heard some of the things that had happened in my life, because I wasn't gonna. I wasn't going to tell. I wasn't going to, you know, let her know about certain things because I wanted, part of me wanted to protect her from some things that might have not have been so great. Um, but when I opened it up and she and I were on the cruise, just the two of us, and sat at the pool and could talk about some of these things, it was extraordinary. And that's when I'm like, oh, we ought to all have, if we can, a mother-daughter trip without dads and brothers and kids and grandkids, just the two of you or you and a good friend, or someone that you want to get to know a little bit better, have that one-on-one -on -one time. It was extraordinary for me. It changed my relationship with my mom. For, 
for the good. And it was good before, but it was it was extraordinary. And then yeah. when we went up onto into Jamaica, <laughs> and I know where you're going. I got to tell everybody, Cece and I went up and did the zip line, and you and Barrett Matthews went and did the bobsled in <laughs> Jamaica. <laughs> Tell everybody why you did that, and then what happened afterwards. Oh, and, oh my God! It was too much fun. We went up all the way up with that with the with the car, and then we did the bump sled. And it was it was like I wanted to do it, and then I put um, um, Barrett in front. <laughs> I was like, Oh my God! I don't want to be in front of this thing. And so we did that, and then we left there, and they were having drumming and all of this kind of stuff. Um, on another part of that whole area. And so we went over there, and we got into the dancing, and we got on the stage, and your mom, <laughs> me and your mom ended up on the stage dancing and everything else. And it was, it was just, it's just a great feeling to be able to just express yourself. I think dancing, enjoyment, music, all of this allows us to be who we are and actually show other people that part of us that very few times we do I had never seen my mother do that when I came down from the zip line <laughs> and I heard the music going and it was the crazy you know the the drums and everything else yes. and I look up on the stage and I see you and you're just flailing around it was hysterical and then I see my mother beside you doing the same thing I'm like oh my gosh she is so out of her comfort zone <laughs> It was so not her, but oh my gosh, did she have a blast. Yes. And the giggles and laughs from you guys. And then, and then the, <laughs> it was of course, incredible. It was, of course it then was, the, the band started getting in on it and was egging mom on to do all this crazy dance. And oh, she had so much fun. It was cool. That was so cool. Yeah. It was and, one of those memories that stay with you for a lifetime. You can always look back on it and just enjoy and savor it and all this kind of good stuff. And your mom was such a good sport. She was a great sport, you know what I mean, to jump in there with everybody and stuff like that. So that was interesting because obviously, and I met her, you know, like you said, Women of Wisdom, you know, there were the, 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 our elders in the crowd, and to see her get up there, oh, my God, it was amazing. Well, and it was her birthday, so it was a really special yeah event mm -hmm. uh, and just so much fun yeah that was an incredible and, and honestly that was the first time that she had ever told her story when we gave the women of wisdom an opportunity to speak up uh, that was one of the first times she ever told some things about her life which yeah. again I think was very liberating very encouraging and lovely for me to hear and fortunately it was recorded and I was able to take that back and share it with my brothers um, nice, so it was. Nice. It was I just, think you, you should do a segment with Women of Wisdom. Absolutely, absolutely. Maybe. And Ella was I one mean, of those. Ella from uh, Atlanta. That yes, was one of Sharon's yes. friends. Um, mm -hmm. Terrific ladies, just terrific ladies. So let's just move on because I love what you did in Haiti and you delivered toys to the kids. But you have a special love for the little, the young girls in Haiti. What, yes, what's your I mission? Love young people. I um, love the young people, and one of the things that, and a lot of people don't know this, is that sanitary pads is like a luxury in Haiti. It's a luxury. A lot of women and girls who have met 18-year-olds, 17, 15-year-olds, 12-year-olds that have come into puberty that are young ladies, they have no access to sanitary pads. They, their moms can't even afford to buy it, so they resort to tissue, newspaper, pieces of material, whatever they can have, or just stay home. They just stay home. They can't go to school. They can't go to work. They can't go out. They can't be on the street because, of course, nobody wants to be in that condition. So one of my, one of my plans for Haiti is to be able to give women sanitary pads. And there are over a million girls within that spectrum who need this every single month. And people can do this with as little as $5 a month that you can afford to help one girl. You don't have to help everybody. And this is one of the things that I say. You don't have to help every single person. Just help one. And there mm -hmm. is, in, the, in the United States, for instance, there are 367 million people. In Haiti, there is like one million girls. So I think the idea that we can help all of these girls is not 
do is not not doable. You know what I mean? It's something that literally can be done with women because as women, we know, we understand. I mean, a guy might be a, eh, but as a woman, to a woman, to a daughter, to a niece, to a cousin, going into you know puberty and whatever, we understand that process because it lasts for what thirty years. 40 years sometimes, and it's a monthly basis. So I feel that having a sanitary pad, being able to access that, is just as important as having food in your belly. And I have been, you know, I've been told, oh, no, they need food. You know, we don't have to worry about that. But I feel that is so wrong. It's so, you know, the thing we don't talk about, and it's a silent epidemic in Haiti. It's a silent epidemic. Nobody talks about it. You don't hear from any of the NGOs, I'm sorry to say, not the missionaries either. They don't address it. They don't care about it. And it's something that coming from America or Canada it wouldn't even cross your mind. I mean, when I read so that basic. about... When I read your story and, and th that passion project, it took me back to when I was in India a year ago. And that's when I had heard about the Pad Man and the movie. The same thing, you know, the young girls in India. Um, and it really affects who they are because you can imagine at 12, 13, and you, you're not protected and you get shunned or you stay away. You can't, can't leave the house. You, you know, to totally embarrassing, but it affects your, it affects you. You know, and yeah, but you're looked at as dirty, you know, yeah. nasty, stay away from you, you're not good. And even, even, you know, I tell people, think about it today. If you or me were that time of the month, we hide it. We hide yeah. it. We don't want anybody to know yes or no. And people are like, Absolutely. you know, you're right. We hide it. We hide the tampons, we hide the pads, we take our bags, and we go to the washroom. Everybody knows what you're doing, but we yeah. think we're hiding it. Right, and it's such a taboo. So, could you imagine take that and transfer it to a girl who has no access? Mm -hmm. it's so, debilitating. so what do you want? What do you want to do? What I would like to do is to be able to afford to bring down those machines that the Padman created. He built them, he manufactured them, you know, he put it together, and it's only for people to help people in third world country. Um, People like Johnson & Johnson has approached him to buy it, and mm -hmm. he said, no, this is to help those people in the third world country that cannot afford the regular pricing because pads are $7, $8, $10. In, in, in Haiti, let's take Haiti, for example, 10 U.S. dollars doesn't sound like a lot to us, but think about it. Some people work for a dollar a day. A mm. dollar a day. So you're working for a dollar, let's say even $2 a day as a mom. That's $10, 20 30 $40 a month. Can you afford to buy a pack of pads for $10 for your daughter? Yeah, when you look at it that way, you know, food on the table or the pad. And the mom didn't grow up with it, so she wouldn't find the value in it. No. No. So it's not important to her because it's not important. It's not put out there as important. Important is a roof over your head and some food in your belly if you're lucky. But yeah. the roof over the head comes first. The food in the belly comes second. The education is like third maybe. And then the pads is the last thing in the back. So yeah. unless somebody takes that in hand, it's never going to happen. The government doesn't care. The missionaries doesn't care. The NGOs, they don't care. I'm, I, and I will say it out loud, and I will challenge them because they don't. I have approached missionaries, and they're like, that's not important. Getting them food and getting them shelter is what's important. But how can you say something that a woman does on a monthly basis for 20, 30, 40 years is not important? So how can we help? So people can help by, you know, if they're interested, getting in contact with me. If you go to hopecrossingborders.com, um, there is, um, if you want to contact me, put it in there. I usually get notices from people who are interested in helping. They can help. They can donate and so on. My goal is to start bringing down machines once I get to that $10,000 figure. That's what they cost to mm -hmm. ship to Haiti, get it set up. I've already located a house in Haiti where we can start producing from, but it's just to get that money with COVID. That really set things back because I don't know if you remember when we planted that seed on the ship, 2020 was supposed to be the year. Mm. Look what happened. Mm -hmm. Well, but your goal you know, is, again, you're, you're going back to your entrepreneurial 
beginnings where you want them to be able to have uh, a business, start a business so that the women, <coughs> excuse me, the women are doing this and making money and taking care of the women. And That's taking care and helping themselves because once you were able to manufacture some of these women, and not everybody, we're not the same, and people need to recognize that we're not the same. Some people are entrepreneurial, some people are studious, some people are more academic-based, some people are more skill-set, but the people who are entrepreneurial will be able to take these pads to the marketplace and sell them. Mm -hmm. And now they're making a little bit more income for themselves. On top of that, what we want to do in the, in the manufacturing company is to hire women who have very little education or no education and teach them how to work the machines so now they're getting paid and getting a job that chances are they would never get because mm -hmm. they have lack of education, lack of skills. We're willing to teach them how to operate these machines so that they themselves can now have, start having an income. And that will change the, the next generation. It yes, will change the, dynamic, the economy. The trickle down goes on for years because Absolutely. once you're able to start making a little money, you're able to send your child to school. You mm -hmm. have to think about it that way because these women who are not educated don't have any skill set. Are they sending their kids to school? What are they teaching them? Nothing. They're just surviving. Yeah. Food and a place to sleep at night. That's it. Well, With this, they can help themselves. Absolutely, and that's what it's all about. It's about helping them to become self-sufficient and not dependent on, on others. Uh, but that's, you couldn't that's, have said it better. Yeah, it's, it's, I don't want to give handouts. I've never been that person. I don't want to give handouts. I want to teach these girls, women, how to fish and look after themselves. So mm -hmm. when I leave, when I die, when I go away, they can still do that. They can continue mm -hmm to do that. Unlike a lot of the organizations, and I have to say it again, they literally keep giving handouts. So if you give handouts for 60 years, what do you think happens? No, expectations That's of the handouts. expect is handouts, yes. So yeah. they expect a handout. So you go to Haiti, you know, you travel to Haiti, you come to Haiti, and then everybody puts their hand out. But that's what they've been taught. And now you have to unteach that. Mm. You unlearn mm. that. You know what I mean? Now you have to say, no, you can do things for yourself. Here are the tools. Here is the ditch. Let's dig. That's true. So I live in South Florida, and I do have, actually have a lot of friends that have moved here from Haiti. Have, have you been able to round up you know, folks here and say, hey, let's go back home? Can we do that? Or once they get here, they don't wanna, don't wanna, maybe don't want to do that? Honestly, a lot of Haitians, once they leave, and, and this is sadly true, they don't want to go back. And mm -hmm. they will tell you they don't want to go back. I have so many Haitian friends who out here in America, Canada, they don't want to go back. And it's sad because I love my country, Trinidad. I'll go back to Trinidad tomorrow. But unfortunately, a lot of the Haitians, because of the life they led there, Mm -hmm. They come to America, they come to Canada. However, people have come um, as storeways, they've come illegally, they've come on ships, they've come wherever. They have sailed in little dinghies from, from Haiti to Miami because it's not far. It's not far. It's two hours flying. So it's maybe eight hours by a boat. And they come, they're never going to go back. Who wants to go back to poverty? Who wants to go back to not having a place to live? Who wants to go back to no education? Nobody wants to do that. And even the educated ones, they don't want to go back because when you go back, you're part of the diaspora. You're part of those who got out. So now you're not liked. You're not, they don't like you when you come back because you, you're able to get on a plane and get out, and I'm stuck there. What about the people who cannot leave for whatever? They can't get a visa because you need a visa. You can't get anything. You cannot leave the country. That's a tough spot then. You're taking all the educated people out and, who, you know, Whew, I'm just kind of speechless here. I'm trying to figure this all out. How do they feel about you when you come in? Because now you're, you're not from there, but you're challenging them in a way. How are it's you received over there? It's interesting because I'm black. I'm black. Right. And because I'm black and I'm not from Haiti, it, they're like, why are you here? <laughs> they're amazed by the fact that a person like me from another third world country, which Trinidad is, I live in Canada, yes, but the fact that I am willing to come and help them is seen as a plus. For mm. whatever reason, in their heads, Haitians look at me like, wow, you know, you don't, because it's like you don't have to do this. 
you come from a country like us. Why are you doing this? Even Haitians here, they're like, oh, my God, all the stuff you do for my country and everything. They were amazed. They were like, wow, this is amazing that you can do this as a black person because, sad to say, for my own black people, I don't see them in Haiti. I don't meet Jamaicans. I don't meet Trinidadians. I don't meet anybody. They're there. Let me tell you, very, very small numbers, very small. They're there. But I, I've gone to Haiti for 10 years, and if I said to you I met another Jamaican, I would be lying. Or I met another Trinidadian, I would be lying. I never meet them. Well, they're on the other side of the island. They're over in the I don't Dominican. Know where the heck they are. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it's interesting. So when they meet me, they're like, oh, my God, I am welcomed. And people say, oh, they like you better than they like the Haitians who left because I'm coming back. I'm yeah. willing to work. I'm willing to, to, to be in a house with no water, no lights. I'm willing to live like them. I'm willing to stand in your shoes, and that makes the difference. Mm. Well, I, I give you a lot of credit for Women on Fire. There's a lot of energy there, and, uh, and for the women that are involved, the ones I've met, I've kept in touch with some of them over uh, Facebook, and just inc- incredible, because one, one at a time, you can't make a change, but together, you can change the world. And it's just the idea, I mean, just raising the idea of, of what the girls are going through, I, I, honestly, I wouldn't have thought about it. And I've got stuff in my bathrooms here with no young girls in the house. I'm thinking, well, heck, I'm gonna, we need to send it, you know, send it you over. You know, exactly. I mean, on $5 a month, $5? Subscription, get an auto subscribe, you know, let's get Amazon working, you know. Sometimes. You know what I mean? $5 yeah. can change these girls' lives. I mean, yeah. with COVID now, it's so up in the air with all the restrictions and everything, and it's tough, but I would somehow like to keep going. And, you know, if I, once I get the money for the machine, definitely put it down and start something, even if I have to have people there working and I can't go and stuff like that. But we can help these girls. Yeah, we can we can we have the ability, um, Debbie, to help these girls once a month, five dollars, ten dollars, whatever you can afford. Every five dollars is one girl. Every mm-hmm. five dollars, one girl. You can help give that um, basic necessity to this girl that will allow her to be part of the community every single day of the month, not just for twenty three days or twenty days or thing. And you know the other part of that, and people don't talk about it, people just see the period. What about all the problems that people have, like fibroids and all of this stuff? That hasn't even been touched, Debbie. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm just talking about the seven day, right? But there are so many issues with women, you know, that hasn't even been touched, addressed on any level. Exactly. And I'm sitting here too thinking I've, I've been working a lot lately um, with finances and looking, reviewing finances and going back to the emotions of money. And it really, we take it, we, we have to take ourselves back to when we were children and what we heard our parents, how we heard our parents talking about money, our grandparents and how they all dealt with it. The same thing. Take this back to, you know, those young women's um, moms. They were, they weren't taught to take care of that, that part. They, you know, they just kind of hid, you know, so they didn't learn about it. And so that whole psyche, it's in your mind now what you were taught as a child. And to, to release that as an adult, to release the thoughts that you had or the, you know, the, the whole, I take it back to the money doesn't grow on trees, to release that. So many of us that are in our 60s heard that. And, and now it's holding us back from even, you know, trying to grow our own companies because we're thinking, well, I can't talk about it. Or it doesn't grow on trees or I have to work hard. You know, those young girls, you know, to talk about this is such a personal thing. You don't want to talk about it. But, heck, it happens to every single one of us. And exactly. That's, that's the crazy part, Debbie. Every single woman, fathers with children, g- girls in the house, it happens to all of us. Huh, how do we get here? Because of that period. Yeah, well, true. That's how we get here. So why is it such taboo? Why isn't it that we can't talk about it? And then again, too, this is one thing I want to put in. People say to me, oh, well, there's other things that they can use and, you know, whatever. And I said, listen, you have to understand, when you start, you can't start at 10. You have to start at zero. Yeah. Because they're using nothing but paper and little bits of stuff. So you can't bring in these things like, you know, the cups and the this and the that for them because they won't use it. 
You have to go to their level. And a lot of people forget that when they're giving. And this is from a giving standpoint. When you're giving to somebody, you need to go to their level. You cannot impose your ideas. Your ideas are what they should be doing. You and have I think to that, meet them at the, at the level where they will accept it and you work and you move forward with it. Well, I mean, I, it takes me back to that movie again, The Padman. You know, and I watched it on the way home from India. And mm-hmm. the, the difficulty he had, because he went in as a man thinking, you mm-hmm. know, I'm going to make life better for my wife and not understanding the woman's point of view on that one. And when he, when the, when he got the buy-in from the women and the girls, then it could work. Yes. You know, and you're looking at it from a woman's point of view and saying, you know, this is why it's important. But like you said, look at it from the little girl's point of view or the young woman's point of view or the mom's point of view. Uh, and, and it's, uh, you know, my insides are just going, ah, this is, it would be easy, <laughs> you know. Um, but it's not something, again, that we, we would address over here because it's not an issue over here. But it is it over is there. Hard and for people. When I talk to people about it, they're like, oh, my God, I never thought about that. I never thought True. about that. True statement. And, uh, and it's just such an interesting thing. And, and I, you know, I know that you're women on fire, that you've really ignited something in people. And I, I, I wish we didn't have these restrictions where we couldn't see each other. Because I think, you know, when people are together, like when you did your first events and you, you got toys for Christmas. We have toys for tots over here. But, you know, you did it individually, and you were able yeah. to gather a lot of toys for those kids, um, mm-hmm. but probably not enough. And Always never enough. My, my dream one day, because one of my taglines was 10,000 Toys for Haiti, and you can find mm-hmm. me on Facebook on the 10,000 Toys for Haiti, I would one day like to gift 10,000 children in Haiti at Christmas time. Mm-hmm. And the incredible mm-hmm. thing is just one toy. That's it, per child. Because, again, you have to go at the level. Can you, I remember doing a talk, and I asked one of the kids who was there, because I love to have kids when I do my Haitian events, and I said, how would you like find getting one toy for Christmas? And the little boy looked at me like, are you crazy, lady? Nobody gives you one toy for Christmas. Right? Not at all. He was like, yeah. no, I get lots of toys for Christmas. Oh. And everybody just stopped. Because in Haiti, you cannot, give one, you cannot give a bag of toys to one child. I have to literally give one toy to a child. Yeah. And that breaks my heart. Yeah. Well. And yeah. it's when you break it down like that, people start going, oh, my God, yeah. yeah. Has your child ever gotten one gift for Christmas? Ever? No, and I always struggle with that, too. Yeah, because we, yeah, we have overdo. Yeah, ever gotten one gift for Christmas? Never. Yeah. My dad will tell you that he got one gift for Christmas, and that's, you know, he's yeah, 91. That's your dad. Look how far back that is. You know what I mean? Absolutely. That, that time, it was different. Yep, now absolutely. it's like you, you need to give a kid, like the stack has to be to the ceiling, and they're still not happy. And, and I have a problem with that too. You know, we won't, we won't go there, but you know, it comes to gratitude and, and that kind of thing. But, you know, I, I'm looking back at what you're trying to do with the young women. It's different than a gift. I mean, this is, it's a, it's, it's a necessity. It's life changing. It is, it life would changing. be life changing, and 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 I wish that you could get a corporate sponsor to do something like help you out. But um, but you know what? Spreading the word. It's one getting the word out there. And uh, and Allison. So, gosh, this hour has gone by so fast. We we're supposed to have Dr. Tim come on, but this is a girls' conversation. <laughs> Tim, <laughs> it's a girls' conversation. Sorry, Dr. Tim. I'll get you on next week. But Allison, how can again? How can people contact you, and how can we help you out? So you can go to Hope Crossing Borders. There's a contact, and you can uh, you send me some information, your name, and so on. What you would like to do, what you're able to do, you could just go make a donation. There's a donation button as well. You can help us out there. And I just like to add, I don't know if you know this, but I just sponsored a little girl in Haiti. She's four years old, and she's part of a twin. So if there's anybody out there willing to sponsor, it costs like 30 U.S. a month. Not sorry, 60 U.S. a month to sponsor a child. Mm-hmm. Right, so there's right now there's like 50 girls that need sponsorship. So if you would like to do that, the best part of this this is that I will eventually get to Haiti. So you know your money is going to the right place. You know your money is getting to that child to help that child with school, with food, with clothing, so that they can access education. 
because this school is special in that the kids that go there, they if wasn't for sponsors like myself, they could not attend school mm-hmm. at all because the parents don't have the money to pay to, for them to go to school. If you don't have money in Haiti, your children cannot go to school. I have a friend who's doing that over in Uganda, and I'm helping out over there. It's the same thing. And the kids, you know, they go to school one day, and if there's not, if they haven't been paid for the next day, they don't go to school. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's sad. Now, the kids that you're sponsoring, they have families. They're not orphans. Yeah, they They're not living mom, in yeah, orphanages. They have a single mom. I like single moms because, you know, I'm a single mom myself, and mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's harder on a single mom in Haiti to raise two kids. Absolutely. Well, I, I, I honor you for what you're trying to do, and I hope that we can you know, help out a little bit because every little bit helps. That's it. Every, every little, bit, little helps. bit helps. That's what I tell people. People think, like I had one lady said, I saw you doing your $5 drive, but I felt so bad to send $5. So I said, so what did you send? Nothing. Like, I, I don't understand that. Five would have been better than nothing. Exactly. I said, listen, if 20 people did what you did, I now have $100 less. Yeah. So 20 people saw that and said, ah, $5, I can't do that. That's too little. I can't say. But you didn't do it. So that's $100. She said, you know, I never thought about it that way. Mm-hmm. I said, please do the next time. I do it so that people can afford to help because I know it's tough. I know there's all sorts of stuff out there. But I do it to say, you know what, don't give one person 100 Why not make it to 20 people? Why not help 20 organizations? Give them $5 each. As long as we know where the money is going and that it's you know, mm-hmm. going to the children or going to the cause and not going into the coffers of the people that are doing it, that's why I appreciate what you're doing because it's, you know, you're not a big organization. You're a woman that has been there, that has lived it, that has seen it. And, uh, and I honor you and I honor the woman, women, the woman on fire organization. Fire. <laughs> but the women that are on fire in it, um, and mm-hmm. I love that, you know, the woof, 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 and I said, it's not about a puppy dog, it's hot, 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 because <laughs> there's some hot women in there, and, uh, and thank you so much, Allison, I, you know, this hour has flown by, I love that we've connected, and that we've kept in touch, and when the, when the borders open up again, I'm sure all of us between yeah, Florida and Canada will be seeing each other again, um, mm-hmm. one, one last shout out to Women of Fire, when, when's your next event, and are you doing it on Zoom? I am not, I'm not a lover of Zoom for events because it gets okay. so complicated and, again, people are busy. So the attention span is not there. Okay. Um, and so this year I will be foregoing Woman on Fire um, just because of the dynamics and everything else. But I'm hoping that next year would be the 10th anniversary so it can happen somewhere. Perfect. May not happen here, may not happen in the States, but may happen in Trinidad. My 10th anniversary for Woman on Fire, but it's going to happen. Somehow or the other, Woman on Fire is going to have that 10th anniversary, regard, regardless of what happens. Because there you go. So everybody, if you're listening, go yeah, look at so Woman on Fire. Be able to tune in live <laughs> from wherever maybe, they are to watch. So. Maybe so. And we did do Woman on Fire TV. I was actually watching it on, on uh, YouTube this yeah, morning. Yeah, I saw that. Yep, I was interviewed on that, and it was fun to look back. And the bad hair day, but it was such a fun <laughs> interview. <laughs> So, it's fun to look back at these videos, right? And you're like, wow, look. And for you, it's like, look at the growth. I remember you were just starting out with the woman behind the smile, right? And yeah. look at where you are now. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm so proud of Debbie. Well, look how far you have come. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? And, again, it was you know, one person. getting out from behind that smile. Absolutely. It was that one person at a time, and it was getting on that cruise and, and speaking up in front of you and my mom and, and just – it's been a, an incredible experience and like you all I want to do is help one person um, not get scammed or recover from it and so that's what this series is about and I I honor you again my friend thank you so much for being with us we're going to close up this show today um, thanks everybody for being here we, we are all dedicated to encouraging you to remove the mask of embarrassment and to being your best self we didn't talk much thank about you so being much, a, oh you're welcome my sweetheart um, I haven't talked much about being a, a victim of scam, but if you know of someone that has been or you yourself have been, please visit againstscams.org for assistance and guidance about options in recovery. I'm on the board of directors of SCARS, which is the Society of Citizens Against Relationship Scams. It's an incorporated nonprofit 
Crime Victims Assistance Organization based in Miami, supporting scam victims worldwide. If you can make a donation to that, please go to againstscams.org and I will put up something on my YouTube channel. This episode has been sponsored by BenfoComplete.com, a vitamin supplement company that supports happy and healthy hands and feet for those with neuropathy. If you or anyone you know struggles with the pins and needles or numbness in their hands and feet, check out our Benfo TMing products at BenfoComplete.com and use the special code STANDUP for 5% discount on your purchase. Thanks again, everybody. Go to my website, The Woman Behind the Smile, for additional information and resources. I will post this on YouTube, and it goes on to um, Anchor and SoundCloud as far as MP3s. Subscribe to us, follow us, watch us. Come back next week. This has been an incredible stand up and speak up with the hot, hot, hot Allison Harvey from Woman on Fire. Everybody have a marvelous day. Thanks so much for being with us.